So I'm very excited to do this panel uh, because, I mean, let's face it, valuations are down. The uh, IPO market for tech companies seems all but shut. There's a lot of nervousness out there. And yet, somehow, VCs managed to gather more in capital commitments in the first quarter of this year than they have since 2006. Um, so if you're wondering what's going on, join the club. <laughs> um, we're hoping these three savvy investors can help us out today. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So Chris, you are an LP, and in fact, you're an investor in Josh's fund. Um, so I, my biggest question right now is, you know, it seems like VCs are returning to their in investors much faster than they have historically. Uh, you know, I think maybe over the last decade, it's been standard to raise a fund every three or four years, and that might even be conservative. Now we're seeing Excel, Lightspeed, Founders Fund coming back in two years. Right. What's going on? So, and by the way, just for people who don't know about the voodoo that I do, as an LP, I'm kind of the money behind the money. So people in my seat fund people like, uh, like Josh and Andy, and, and I used to be at Princeton's Endowment, and now I work at a, uh, at a fund of funds group. And so we're kind of the, the sunlight, in a sense, of the, uh, of the venture world. It, you know, all of the energy, in a sense, comes from us. If the LPs stop showing up, um, the, the, you know, the trees will kind of wither. Um, and so, uh, does that sound grandiose, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but one of the challenges is that, uh, that the pool of LP capital isn't infinite, like some people sometimes seem to think it is. In fact, um, dollars going into venture capital compete at the institutions uh, uh, where these dollars come from against other asset classes in terms of what's the most attractive risk-adjusted return. And so uh, one of the challenges that venture faces is that it's the furthest out of the money, longest dated option that most institutions, um, most institutions buy. And so as a result, you know, there's a lot of pressure on venture. Um, and one of the things that's been challenging is you kind of uh, discussed over the last few years, the periodicity of fundraising has really shortened. Mm -hmm. So today it is a kind of a two-year cycle. The challenge is that, um, you know, investing nirvana for an LP is when you've got uh, when, to a point where your program is mature enough that you're recycling distributions. So the money that you send out, hopefully each dollar comes back with three of its friends in relatively short order. So one of the challenges is that historically fundraising cycles were four or five years and liquidity cycles were five, six, seven years. And so you'd send out dollars and they'd come back and they'd fund your kind of subsequent commitments. What's gone on now is that as fundraising cycles have shortened, liquidity cycles have gotten longer. And so the way I describe it is there's this huge exit sphincter, mm -hmm. right? So we're pushing all this capital out. <laughs> he did just out. say what you thought he said, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're pushing this capital out and, and we're kind of feeding the snake and you know, LPs give GPs money, GPs give it to startups, startups get liquid, and it comes back to the LPs, and then the, the cycle starts over again. When you've got this exit sphincter and the snake is getting packed fuller and fuller and fuller, it reminds me of, you know, we're in Brooklyn, so not exactly the Shaolin, um, but for those of you who are familiar with Wu-Tang Clan, there's a song, Method Man, um, where one of the methods of torture that they talk about is, that, you know, they say, I'm gonna sew your rectum shut, and I'm gonna keep feeding you and feeding you and feeding you, and that's what it's like to be an LP today. So the <laughs> dynamic you describe is actually a, a really kind of unsettling long-term dynamic for long-term ecosystem health. But why is it happening? I mean, I know that, uh, you know, on the one hand, I did, it did seem like startups were raising funding every, you know, six months or so, um, but critics, including Bill Gurley, who I spoke with, very recently said, you know, these guys are racing back to their investors before their paper gains uh, disappear. Is that, do you think there's, that's? So, so it, it's a really important point because um, right now a lot of venture funds are looking amazing on paper, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in fact, one thing that's a pet peeve of mine is I get emails every day um, that say, you know, our fund is marked at whatever. And somebody said to me the other day, we just had a bunch of markups, and so our fund is sitting at a 3x cash on cash. I said, no, it's paper on cash, mm -hmm. right? You, and there's this moment, um, you know, when I was doing public market stuff before business school, we always talked about uh, that pit you get in your stomach when a trade turns into an investment, right? Something went bad, and you're going to hold it a long time. Similarly, I fear that as an industry, we're headed for this moment where the unrealized, right, because everybody's got unrealized gains in their portfolio, there's this moment where the unrealized becomes the unrealizable, and that's gonna be the moment of, of you know, kind of nausea. Because, so I think Bill's absolutely right. A lot of people are rushing back. Nobody wants to be the last fund in the market right. when the music stops. It's, right. it's gonna be a game of musical chairs. And I'll tell you, from the LP perspective, everybody <coughs> tapped out, you know, both in, in terms of capital, people have blown through their budgets because things have, you know, companies have come back so fast, and, uh, and we're also just exhausted. Like, there's this, 
you know, kind of psychic exhaustion amongst LPs. Everybody's been running too hard and, uh, you know, kind of reacting rather than being proactive. So Andy, your firm, Union Square Ventures, just closed a 166-ish million dollar fund? Yeah, we don't really talk about our fundraising. Really okay. <laughs> well, you filed, a f you filed a form with the SEC suggesting as much, and you had last raised a fund in 2012. So you're sort of sticking to your to tr traditional trajectory, it sounds like. Josh, what about you? You raised your last fund in 2014, 175 million dollars. Are you in the market this year? So we typically raise, we target raising every two and a half years. Okay. So that would put us on pace to raise at the end of this year. Okay, great. Um, I guess, um, it, Chris, uh, do you feel like uh, you can say no? I mean, you obviously would never say no to Josh <laughs> for good reason. But, um, you know, when I spoke to Bill, he also made this point that uh, it's very hard for LPs because if you say no, you can lose your seat at the table possibly for the duration of your career as an LP. Do you feel that that's true? It's absolutely true. And uh, it's interesting because we were just talking about this backstage. Um, the Yale Investments Office, which is kind of the, the exemplar of, uh, you know, they, they basically invented the game in a sense from the institutional investment perspective. One of their secrets to success historically has been getting off the bus one stop too early rather than one stop too late. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that takes a lot of courage. And, uh, you know, most investors lack courage because they focus too much on career risk and there's a whole principal agent problem there. And furthermore, you know, once you say no to a fund, you're forever in that GP's bad graces. Right. Um, and look, you know, we all have uh, examples. Um, I, I'll say, I, I wrote a blog post a long time ago called The Epistemology of Investing. Like, why do we believe what we believe? What is our justified true belief? And the thing that made me think of that when I wrote it was, you know, I said no to the Excel Facebook fund twice. When I was at Princeton and then again when I went to TIFF because I left just as they were raising. And, you know, everything in that moment said that that was, you know, that was a, an easy no, and boom, they put up one of the greatest funds ever. Right. And, you know, I've been persona non grata there, not explicitly, but, you know, uh, let's just say I'm not on their speed dial. Right, right. Well, Andy, USV has famously wonderful returns. Um, but sort of speaking more broadly, this is a very funky market. I mean, how do VCs turn their paper gains into cash on cash returns? Well. It's not really up to us. We don't have control over it, right? The companies have control over it. My partner Fred has been pretty outspoken that companies should be going public as a way to get liquidity. More companies should be going public. That's one way to do it. And so that's one of the issues is the number of IPOs has dramatically decreased. So therefore, companies don't get liquid. We don't get liquid. Chris doesn't get liquid. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm having a tiny bit of trouble hearing you. But Josh, what do you think? So I, I, I tend to agree with Andy that that we're seeing a lack of IPOs in the market. I think part of that is caused by the fact that there's a massive dislocation between how private markets are valuing companies mm -hmm. and how public markets are valuing companies. You know, we're, we're at this rare moment in time. You know, it used to be that com you know, private companies would aspire to, to go public so that they could achieve the public market valuation. Mm -hmm. We're in the rare moment in time where it's almost the opposite. It's as if the, the minor league ball players are getting paid far more mm -hmm. than the professional all-star MVP major league ball players. Right. And until that works itself out in the market, it's going to create a really challenging time for these companies that are being valued in the private markets to realize anything near that price in the public markets. Right, right. But if, mar if markets are efficient, that, should, that equilibrium should occur at some point, correct? It, and, and, and it looks like we might be seeing some of that correction now in the market. Right, right. But it's interesting because there's a, a real echo chamber dynamic. And, um, and one thing that always strikes me as an LP is when you do get these disconnects, it's very difficult to, um, you know, to kind of, you know, glide back to kind of this rational ordering. And, as a result, you get um, you get these funky kind of risk-adjusted return inflections, where you've got uh, you know kind of private companies more value than public companies. If I were you know if I if I could wave a magic wand, I'd invent a way at times to short private companies, right? Because that that would kind of you know uh, well, recreate the equilibrium. But there's the stale prices associated with private companies make right. it possible to do. Public that. companies trade every day. Good news, they trade. Bad news they trade. Private companies typically trade on one of two reasons. When 
there's good news and the company wants to fundraise, or when the company needs cash so badly that they're willing to trade on bad news and capitulate on price. Mm. And what that means then is that you know, you, you're going to need to see um, companies end up having to, some of these companies will have to work through their cash um, before these private companies trade to sort of where the market should be. You know, I also think that we're at this interesting point where we don't know, where the industry is trying to figure out, are we using the right, the, the right comps? Mm -hmm. Are lending companies a fintech innovation, innovative marketplace and should be valued as such, or should they be valued as lenders? Right. Should e-commerce, disruptive e-commerce companies be, be labeled as real in technology innovators, or are they a mattress company? And, 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 and they, they get valued differently based on that. Right, and even companies that are very clearly creating markets, like Uber, nobody knows what to price it at. I mean, I thought it was interesting. Uh, Keith Raboy of uh, Coastal Ventures talked to Business Insider maybe Friday or this weekend, and he's, he thought that uh, Uber, if traded publicly, would probably go out at around 25 billion, which is obviously far less than uh, its private company value. Um, do you think there's going to be maybe a watershed moment? Sometimes when I talk to IPO experts, they're like, oh, you know, um, I think this uh, stock exchange operator, Bats Global, went public, and they thought maybe that would be it. Uh, I believe that we may be seeing the first tech company go public this year, this week. Uh, I don't know what it is. I think it's a networking company, Acacia Communications. Um, but are you sort of thinking like maybe when Uber goes or, you know, is there like a certain company that everybody's kind of waiting on to open up this market? Not necessarily. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a seed stage investor. So for me, I, I typically fund at the earliest end of the cycle. Um, right. And I'll leave the sort of prognosticating on, on what is that watershed moment to the public market investors. Okay. What are you guys seeing in M&A? Um, you know, uh, the investors also like to point out the fact that these companies, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, have these enormous balance sheets, but they seem like very reluctant buyers. Um, I mean, are you talking, are your companies talking to these companies? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, we're, we're, there's a high level of activity. I don't know if there's a high level of desire to pay prices that um, that may be divorced a little bit from fundamentals mm -hmm. uh, and maybe there was more of that in the past and it seems like there's less of that right now. I guess it's probably also a sort of a, a catching a falling knife sort of thing you know they you know why not wait another six months and see where prices are? Yeah I mean there, there are obviously some companies where they they buy them for far more strategic reasons in terms of access to technology, access to talent, um, filling a critical strategic hole, um, you know, or access to customers. So you can look at the WhatsApp acquisition by, by Facebook, you know, in, in that regard. Um, you know, but if it's, if it's financially driven, it's obviously going to be subject to the same market forces that the IPO market are going to be for, right. are subject to. And what are you seeing in terms of valuations? On the West Coast, at least, it seems like valuations are down a little bit. Um, George Zachary of CRV, who I interviewed maybe last week, was saying uh, the one exception is celebrity investor, meaning you know serial entrepreneurs who are creating companies in the space where they already have some expertise. Is that true on the East Coast as well? Yeah, we've seen it on both coasts. We've seen valuations have taken a slight dip, but remember, in the last four years, m the, uh, the average seed state valuation has almost tripled. So, so even if it's down 10 or 20%, um, it, it, it's still a very attractive time to be an entrepreneur. What do you think, Andy? Is it? Yeah, you know, I don't, we don't really track valuations that much. You know, every, every deal, there's a moment in time where, where, uh, where there's a company that desires to have an investor and at a certain price and an investor desires to invest at a certain mm -hmm. price. And so I don't, I, have, I don't see any generalizations that it's higher or lower you know, than before. I do uh, sense there's some uncertainty in the market and so entrepreneurs maybe are more flexible uh, okay. than they have been in the past, but I don't really track valuations. But the v and the VCs don't, you don't think are more price sensitive than they have been in the past? You know, you know, we look at, as a firm, we're a firm that doesn't invest that often, you know, eight to ten times a year, and so that's eight to ten data points, so it probably doesn't really expand out to generalizations. Okay. And so? You do see a lot, you, you see many companies. Yeah, though. sure, sure. And we're focused on it, obviously, but for us, it's, 
we need to invest what we think is the right amount of money and get an ownership position that allows us to deliver people like Chris their returns. Right. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. Has that but changed? You said entrepreneurs are being more flexible. So can you get more for your dollar? I mean, are, are they sort of, you know, maybe a couple of years ago they're like, oh, we'll give you guys 15%. Now they're like, take 20%, 25%. I mean, we don't, I don't know about how you think about it. We don't, we don't attempt to try to get more for our dollar, right? It's not like a commodity, you know, it's like the right amount relative to the risk relative to our expectations, again, to deliver our LPs some money. In fact, for us, a lot of times, we don't want it to be that much because that means it comes out of the other side, you know, the entrepreneur side. Right. Great point. But it's, it's interesting, too, because I talk to a lot of portfolio companies because they see me as, a, a, you know, maybe a, a honest broker in a sense um, and, and not one of these sharks from Shark Tank. No, just kidding. Um, but, uh, but it's interesting because uh, the, in Palo Alto, at least where I live, Valuation expectations had been kind of, you know, cranking ever upwards, and I think you know we're seeing this first kind of chill, uh, where you know we've started to see some tech company uh, 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 layoffs. And you know, from my seat, you know, I, I invest in a couple of dozen funds. From my seat, what I've seen, and I, I'm kind of a big second derivative guy. I'm not, you know, terribly smart, but I remember from from math class, you know, it's it's the rate of change or the rate of change, I guess. You know, while the market's still going up, the rate is slowing somewhat in terms of, of markups. That's that's what we saw kind of, I think, in Q4 and Q1. And I think as we, you know, see the kind of, you know, market maybe plateau in terms of expectations, I am seeing some investors, you know, the market's not clearing for some companies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so the transactions just aren't getting done and hopefully we'll see, you know, reset of investor expectations um, and, and entrepreneur expectations, I should say, um, you know, to kind of get us back to a, an interesting kind of uh, uh, return, you know, potential opportunity. Right, right. You know, as as the market has gotten choppy over the last couple of quarters, you know, it's also important to, to realize that you have a whole generation of founders and to some degree funders, investors, yeah. who have never been through a downturn, yeah. right? Like they're, they're, if you've been in the industry for the last seven years, you've seen straight up. Um, so, so it's also just important that, you know, I don't think it's ever as bad as people think it is. And it, you know, it probably wasn't as good for the last seven years in terms of if you look at sort of where the marks are, they're probably, you know, most venture firms probably have inflated marks right now. Right. And, and by the way, on, on that topic, you know, Josh, you know, identifies seven years. Um, you know, and I, I'll even kind of say that I think 08 was a, a, kind of a gag, right? You know, most companies, and I shouldn't say that, but, but uh, necessarily, but, but most companies have cash for, you know, kind of 12 to 18 months at any given time. And that was a, a very short downturn. That was more of a slide deck than a downturn, right? Good times RIP and, and everybody felt like they, they, so I meet with a lot of folks that are raising funds and say, oh, you know, in 08, you know, this is what I did. I did X, Y, and Z. I remember 01 and 02, I was at Princeton then. And I, I learned the, you know, relearned what the word, speaking of math terms, what asymptote meant, right? Like you saw this grinding, like every quarter we're down 20% and there's this level, you know, 0.2x of value and we're just asymptoting towards that line. Fund after fund after fund, you're eight quarters of markdowns. Mm -hmm. That was a grinding downturn. That's where you had financing risk. That's where you had, you know, operations risk. That's where you had all kinds of syndicate risks that, you know, nobody's seen for 15 years. And you don't necessarily, I mean, you don't think we're heading into that? This I now don't think we're heading okay. into that. Okay. But I think people who, who say, you know, kind of puff their chest and say, you know, I've lived through a downturn have no clue. Right. We're two generations removed in terms of companies from the last real downturn. But, okay. at some, but at some level, it is different this time. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> right, and part of the challenge is to figure out how it's different or in what ways it's different. Right? And I agree, it's a challenge when you've been in an environment of 10 years of rising asset prices, that's the, that's the rhythm or the cadence that you know, rising at the asset prices. And when they're not rising anymore, you need to learn new rhythms or new cadences. At the same time, in that 10 year period, we all got computers in our pockets, right? right? And so the dynamic does, it does feel like it's different. Obviously our, job is to, our jobs are to figure out in what ways it's different and find the right clearing prices. But at the same time, it's not that, it doesn't feel like the world is falling apart here. Absolutely. Right? It doesn't feel like the world is falling apart, but the question really is, how different is it? Um, I mean, it seems to me like it's different, but then again, you hear investors say, you know, there's this fundamental misunderstanding, even though the opportunity is global, even though everybody has a smartphone in their pocket, there are still going to be like this very small number of breakout winners. Do you guys agree, disagree? I mean, has, has the opportunity set you know, is the size of the winner circle changing or 
or is the, are the winners just getting bigger? I mean, I think that's sort of always the You point. know, so yes and yes, right? At some level, the, 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 the leading companies today the, who are the incumbents that really didn't exist 10 years ago are incredibly powerful positions, right? right? And they have incredible advantage to them. At the same time, the opportunity set seems, you know, broader too as well. And that's a tough balance to strike. So I, I, I founded my first company, co-founded it in 92. And you know, right when the, you know, the year before the web browser was invented and saw the internet sort of rise. And I remember everyone talking about how the internet is going to disrupt every portion of, you know, of daily life. And it really has. And yes, while you now could go global, and yes, you now are mobile, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't believe that we're done creating amazing companies. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also don't believe that this time is fundamentally different, and this time is 3x larger than the last time. And 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 you know, and and, and the market's going to need to figure out, as Andy said, how to how to price that. Everyone was talking about a speculative bubble when Amazon went public, and they went public at a value of 500 million dollars. You know, you now have like Jet.com, which is the Amazon 2.0, which is raising in the private markets at a 1.5 billion dollar price. So. So you know, you're, you're, you know, the opportunities are still there, um, but you, you know, I, I'm not a believer that you're going to see a, a massive increase in the number of epic companies that are created. And, and from my seat, you know, one thing I'm always cognizant of is the return on any asset is largely a, a you know a function of the price you pay, right, and the, also the capital you, you consume. And so as we've seen, um, you know, pricing go up and up and up. Uh, in terms of startups, you know, Jed is an example, or you know, a, a, literally you could point at any startup. Um, you know, they're raising. You know, I, I, one thing that actually always strikes me as a quick aside is that if I look at my portfolio, and you know, Josh is in my portfolio, first round, and first round has a bunch of companies that would be in the S and P mid cap 400, right? Which is amazing, right? And and you know, and I see entrepreneurs raise money in the private markets at these valuations, and at the end of the day, you got to think about how am I going to put the moolah in the kula. Right, because you've got you know from from the valuations that we're in, you know investing at now to the exits, right? When we open up that exit sphincter and the capital comes through and comes back to me, are we you know are we uh, are we getting the kinds of returns that we expect, or are the returns becoming more pedestrian? So what do you need to believe? So, if, you know, if as Andy says, and I, I believe this, this time it is different. Um, you know, that, that you will see larger outcomes. You know, that's great. But all of the losses pretend bigger holes. Mm -hmm. That's what I worry about. Well, there's two. The, the, there's a, the paradox is that I think that, and maybe I disagree with Josh. I think the opportunity set is much greater than 3x than it was when you started your first company. Could be 10 or 20 or, or 100x. And so I don't. I don't think that that to me is a reality. The question is, where do investment returns come from that? And that's uncertain. And then if the investment returns don't come that feed what we need to return to you, what are the implications of that? What are the implications of that to the next generation of funds or generation of entrepreneurs? I don't have an answer to that. I find that to be a key question. To me, the question is less, are there those great opportunities? I think there are. I think oh, they're I'm, fu I'm, fu I'm but fundamentally bigger. Right. In the meantime, are you guys, since, since the IPO market's kind of shut right now, uh, m and slow, um, your Series A and seed investors, are you seeing that your follow-on investors are changing at all? I keep hearing about hedge funds, mutual funds sort of retrenching. This uh, you know, apparent opportunity uh, to do sort of Series B and C deals. A couple of funds recently, Menlo, um, Menlo Ventures and Mayfield raised opportunity funds to tackle this particular perceived or real gap. What, what do you, is it real? So, so it's hard to take one quarter or two quarters and try to extrapolate. Um, you know, we're, we're still seeing that good companies can get funded in the follow-on market by good investors. Um, you know, so I, I, yeah, there are, there are, you know, as the markets have grown, we've seen, a, 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 as, the, as the valuations have gone up, as more companies have, 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 have sort of achieved unicorn status, we've seen more investors, non-traditional investors, um, come into the space, but I haven't yet seen the surrender of the existing traditional venture investors. Yeah, and I want to, actually I want to go back to something I said is I don't, the IPO market is, is never either open, is neither open nor shut. It is what it is. It's company's choice to go public. They might not like 
the process. They might not like the prospects right. that come That's from right. it, but it is always open. Right. You know, and it's your choice. And the challenge that some of us are facing is there's the disconnect between the private valuations and what companies they think they can get in the IPO market. The IPO market is always open. Uh, we're almost out of time, Chris. Any last thoughts? Just put the moolah in the cooler, guys. <laughs> <laughs> guys, thank you so much for being thank here you. today. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right.